go. Got it. All right. Voila. Okay. Everyone ready? Okay. Uh, hi, my name's Carter. And I'm going to follow up uh, where I left off, and I'm going to introduce you to my journey a little bit um, and how I am an artist, but I am now sort of expanding my my realm of activity. And so I'm going to just start with the beginning, which is this picture. Now, how many of you have seen An Inconvenient Truth? About half of you, right? So, or anybody who's <coughs> seen Osborne's presentation, you know that this is, this is the first picture we really ever got of the Earth from space. This picture, normally called Earthrise, it's actually was taken upside down from this, and yada yada, but this is... This, this picture is, is credited with launching our current environmental movement, all the stuff we're talking about in terms of sustainability, etc. kind of got started with this picture because, well, it's the first time we realized, oh, <laughs> we're just this little ball hanging on space, <laughs> right? So that picture was taken when I was about two, 1968, okay? Now... That's not me, that's my daughter. She was two. But a lot's changed from the time that I was two to when she was two. So we had this like launching of the first environmental movement, but by the time I had a daughter and she was two, we're now talking about, well, what does it mean that the ice cap is gonna melt? Like that's actually the big question now. In fact, when she was two, the predictions were that the ice cap might melt in 70 years. That meant that if she lived to be my mother's age, to be a grandmother, she would see this profound event happen on the planet. I mean, this is a geologic feature of the planet, gone and just gone, basically. So I thought that was profound enough that I decided to devote the rest of my career to understanding what that means and engaging it in whatever way was necessary. But I wasn't sure what that was yet. I was really quite concerned with ethics and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, I, I was like theology even. I was looking at all kinds of different you know, degrees to go do and other things to study. Um, and one of the things I kept looking at was I just I kept wondering, like, what do we really understand about this? And at the time, my perception was that a lot of people, it was very hard to communicate about climate change back then. This is, you know, only 10 years ago, but even then, you know, the, the, the level of understanding and the level of communication going on around this big, profound event of climate change was pretty narrow, actually. Uh, and I kept coming back, like, we don't even understand what we're doing. We're rushing to do stuff about it. So uh, I uh, ended up coming back, uh, I kept coming to Berkeley, actually, and doing a master's at the Energy and Resources Group, which is, uh, uh, I think there's an undergraduate minor now in Energy and Resources, but it wasn't when I was there. Uh, and I wrote a, a thesis entitled, Who Will Cry for the Ice? I, I looked at the conceptual metaphors that uh, we look at in understanding climate change and try to decide what that means. Okay? And so I want to read you the abstract from this because I picked it up and read it the other day and I was like, oh, God, I read, I, not only is that not bad, but I kind of, yeah, I'm not, like I'm still on it, you know? So the abstract of my paper was, is an, an examination of conceptual metaphors we use everyday speech can provide insight into how we think about and understand the world. Conceptual understanding of climate change is shaped not only by scientific research, but also by everyday metaphors for much such mundane topics as warming or change. So for example, change is motion, and we learn that because a ball moved across the room when we were two, and so it changed, and that's motion. So we talk about things speeding up or slowing down or stopping climate change as if it's a thing that could be stopped. Right? Starting with an examination of how our most basic conceptual metaphors influence how we see climate change, this research then examines how competing worldviews dictate how global warming is understood in threats. And finally, how emerging terms create assumptions that influence how global warming is understood. So for exa an example of that, for example, we have the idea of the greenhouse effect. That's a scientific term. But 
house comes with certain entailments, like our houses today have thermostats. So if we use a greenhouse, you, you know, interpret, oh, that means I've got a thermostat, we have a thermostat we can control, but we don't, but we, but we infer that in our understanding of things. So it gets complicated. And on top of it, um, uh, well, I'll keep con continuing. Uh, this paper suggests that our conceptual understanding is limited by our physical experience of the world, and how we understand climate change is influenced by our life priorities and worldview, which in turn shapes our day-to-day -day activities. Okay, so a further problem is that climate change is so big that it quickly becomes a social metaphor. It becomes an abstract idea that doesn't mean anything. So you ask, like, what's important to you, right? And that's like how you engage sustainability. But there's also what's important to you about what you care about. So for a lot of people, climate change is just a political thing, right? Well, that's not because it, it, I mean, there's politics involved, but that's because there's a lot of people for whom government taking over our lives is the big drama going on in their, was already there. So climate change just fits into that frame. And it doesn't become a scientific question. It becomes, oh, it's coming from this other part of the scenario, right? If you cared about sports more than anything else, the same sort of thing would happen. Right? Climate change would be a big deal because I'm not going to be able to ski, which is true. <laughs> okay, so, uh, the conclusion ponders the question, what is missing? And the answer implies that our conceptual understanding is likely flawed and incomplete. And suggests more complex understanding may be found using indirect methods such as art. Okay, so what I concluded essentially was that we don't really, we're not even touching or scratching the surface of understanding or having a big enough view of what's going on to really get it. Yeah. And that in order to really get that view, it's oftentimes going to take indirect things like art. So that